Today's lecture is about deformation and crystallographic texture. Uh, by texture, we mean a polycrystalline material that has a non-random distribution of crystal orientations. This is a, a single crystal, and we are going to deform it by applying a force along the vertical axis. The cross-sectional area of the crystal is capital A, and lambda is the angle between the slip direction and the force axis, and phi between the slip normal and the force axis. The cross-sectional area is A, but the area of the slip plane will be A divided by cos of phi. And the force that is resolved onto the slip direction will be F cos lambda. Okay. So the shear stress on that slip plane is the resolved force divided by the area of the slip plane, which is F cos lambda over A over cos 30, uh, cos phi. And when I rearrange that, I get the shear stress as being F cos lambda cos phi divided by the cross-sectional area A. And this is what we call the Schmidt factor, where cos lambda cos phi is a maximum when both of these are at 45 degrees. Uh, cos 45, cos 45 will give you 0 0.5, and that's the maximum value the Schmidt factor can have. So there will be multiple slip systems in our crystal, and the one that will operate will be the one with the largest Schmidt factor. So here is our single crystal again, and we are applying a force along the vertical axis and the effect of its resolved component along the slip direction on the slip plane is to create a step here in the direction of this unit vector S. And the top half is displaced with respect to the bottom, causing the force axis to rotate to a new position, F dashed, where F dashed is the sum of F and uh, the amount of shear that we've applied times the unit vector S. Now, instead of this force axis rotating, it's more common that we keep the force axis constant because we are testing by pulling in a machine, for example. Uh, and therefore, instead of the force axis rotating, it, the crystal itself will rotate to satisfy this equation. And this is such a case where we are pulling a single crystal create lots of slip steps uh, like this, and the slip planes and slip directions are rotating to comply with the fact that the force axis ought to be changing. Now, this equation also implies that F dash is a linear combination of F and alpha S, which means that they are all three vectors are coplanar. And on a stereographic projection, we can represent that. Uh, this is the slip plane, uh, in the northern hemisphere and the trace of the slip plane in the southern hemisphere. Uh, this is the force axis. This is F dashed. And you can see that F dashed, as we deform, moves towards the shear direction S, which lies in the slip plane. Now, the common uh, metals that we use are body centered cubic and face centered cubic, and they have slip systems which are easy to remember. So here we have a, a closed back plane and a closed back direction within that plane as the slip system. And in this case, this plane is the most closely packed plane and this is the closed back direction within that plane. So there will be 24 variants of each of these slip systems in each of these crystals. Now, we can work out which particular slip system, for example, one bar one one and one one zero in the FCC might actually operate by working out the Schmidt factors for all 24 possibilities and looking at which one is the maximum. And we expect that one to operate. Instead, what we'll do is we'll plot a stereographic projection and 
these are the stereographic triangles, all of which are crystallographically equivalent. As you can see, they all have a triad at a corner, a tetrad at another corner, and dyad at uh, the third corner. So supposing we have a particular crystal, and this is the orientation of the tensile axis, uh, which we apply to deform that crystal. Then to find the slip system that operates, the one with the maximum Schmidt factor, the slip direction and the slip plane have to be really approximately close to 45 degrees. So for example, um, if I take this as the tensile axis, that slip plane is too far away to give me the maximum uh, Schmidt factor. So is that. Uh, this one is too close. And this one is just about 45 degrees away. It doesn't have to be exactly 45 degrees, but we want the maximum Schmidt factor. And similarly, if I look at the other slip directions, this one seems to be the correct one. And notice that this actually lies in this plane. Okay, if I take a dot product of 0, 1, 1, and 1 bar 1, 1, I get uh, 9, uh, I get um, 0 because this lies in this plane. Now, an easy way to remember how to find the slip system is this is my tensile axis. If I go to the nearest slip direction and reflect it through the opposite side of the triangle, then I end up with the correct slip direction. Similarly, if I take the tensile axis, go to the nearest closed back plane uh, on this triangle and reflect it through the opposite side, I end up with the correct slip plane and slip direction. So you can try that with any, any other position on this projection. I'd like to prove to you that uh, this really works. So here is a movie describing why Deal's rule, uh, which is the rule that I've just described, actually works. So here's our stereographic projection, and that's where we apply the tensile axis. We superimpose on it a wolf net, and we rotate the net so that the red pole lies on a great circle. I then measure off 45 degrees this way and 45 degrees this way, and find the geometric center by taking these two a red axis and dividing the distance by two. So I have this as the geometric center and construct a small circle, which is, which represents 45 degrees uh, at any point about this, uh, this pole. And you can see that the bar one, bar one, one and O one, one are pretty close to 45 degrees, uh, giving us the maximum Schmidt factor. Okay, so what I did was I took this pole, measured on this great circle 45 degrees, and going again from the red point to this 45 degrees, but because of angular distortion, this is not the center of the circle. So I take this distance here, divide by two, and that gives me the geometric center, and draw this small circle, all points on which will be at 45 degrees to the red pole. It turns out that this slip direction and this slip plane are going to give me the maximum Schmidt factor, as we deduced by applying Deal's rule. Okay, now what happens when we apply a tensile force at a particular orientation, but as the crystal deforms, the force axis is moving, and it will move towards the shear direction. So for this tensile orientation, I go to the nearest O11, reflect to the opposite side, and that is my slip direction. Therefore, the tensile axis will move towards that slip direction as deformation progresses. However, at some point it will hit this boundary here. So it then becomes possible for two slip systems with this slip direction and this slip direction to be equally stressed. And the tensile axis will then rotate as you deform towards the mean slip direction. So if I add 011 and 101, I get 112. 
So it starts off moving towards 101, and it hits this edge, it starts moving towards 112, assuming that these two slip directions are applying equally. Now, for this, the slip plane is um, this one here. If I, if I go to the nearest one and one, reflect to the opposite side, I get this as the slip plane. And for, for uh, when we are on this side, um, the slip plane is given by this and the slip direction is this, okay? So obviously when we hit a corner, things will get really complicated because many slip systems are equally stressed. But by that point, you know, there will be a lot of interference going on between slip on different systems, work hardening and so on. And it's very unlikely that they operate uh, equally, even if they may be equally stressed. So the effect of uh, this slip is either to move the force axis to a new orientation when you deform the crystal, or if you keep the force constrained to be along a particular axis, then the crystal itself will rotate relative to the force axis. So if we are looking at a polycrystalline material like this, in which we have a number of crystal orientations, and this is a particular kind of rolling mill for making extremely thin uh, sheet of stainless steel for razor blades. And to get a, a, a very thin sheet, you have to use small diameter rolls, but those rolls can be flexible. And obviously you want a parallel sided sheet. So these fine rolls are backed up by a number of other rolls to keep them rigid and therefore you get a very fine and beautiful uh, strip for making razor blades. So this is the um, uh, rolling direction. This is the normal direction to the sheet, plane of the sheet, and this is the transverse direction. And inside the sheet will be a number of crystals. It's a polycrystalline material. And as you deform, the slip planes and slip direction will tend to align uh, in some respect to the deformation directions. So let's imagine that we start off with a thick bit of stainless steel with many different uh, orientations of crystals. And as we roll, there will be a tendency for slip planes to align and uh, slip directions. So what will happen if, if you're looking at this stereographic projection, which is, which is with respect to the macroscopic axis here, and we are plotting the one 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 poles of each crystal inside the uh, lump of material, then there will be a tendency for the crystals to rotate, and therefore they will tend to develop a non-random crystallographic orientation. And that is what we call crystallographic texture, that the individual crystals within a polycrystal are not uh, distributed at random. The material becomes anisotropic because it's somewhere between a single crystal and a completely random polycrystal. In fact, it's very difficult to get a polycrystal which has completely random orientations because during processing, things will happen to make them align. Uh, the only way that I know of making a random polycrystal is to take fine powders and to sinter them together. Okay. Now, it is possible that during sintering there are some small rotations, but in general, that's the nearest you're going to get to a completely random set of orientations. So polycrystalline metals are certainly not completely isotropic. Okay. They will have different degrees of isotropy depending on how much crystallographic texture we have introduced into the material. Um, and in this case, it is by deformation, but it could be by phase transformation under the influence of stress and so on. This is uh, how we express uh, in a very, very simple and oversimplified way, the texture within our sample. So supposing uh, that you get alignment of HKL planes along the rolling plane and UVW directions along the rolling direction, 
and the fraction of grains with that particular um, alignment is 0 0.4 and then there's another set of planes which are aligned to the rolling plane and another set of directions to the rolling direction with a different fraction then that's a, a rough parameter to assess the kinds of components of texture that you have in your material so for example we might have 001 planes aligned to the rolling plane and 100 directions aligned to the rolling plane in just 0.53 of the uh, fraction 0.53 of the total number of crystals and there might be an alternative texture for the remaining crystals okay uh, this stereographic projection shows you the 100 poles of something like 500 different crystals distributed at random Okay, with respect to the rolling direction and the transverse direction as the axes of the projection. Now notice that uh, this is random, but you get, uh, you know, if you squint your eyes, you can see that this region is darker than at the peripheries. And that's simply because the angular distortion associated with uh, stereographic projection, that the angles are more concentrated in the middle than towards the edge. Now, when you deform this material, and uh, the ten, uh, there's a tendency for the crystals to align themselves, we change the stereogram. So this is the same number of crystals, and we are still plotting one zero zero poles. And you can see that the crystals are aligning so that the one zero zero directions become roughly parallel. Okay, it's not perfect at all, but there is clearly a strong alignment and this is a non-random distribution of uh, crystals. Obviously, the material will be anisotropic when we deform it. And one easy way to demonstrate anisotropy is to take uh, your sheet material and to draw it out into a cup. And because these strains along different directions are not identical, you get this effect, which is called earring. Okay? So this is a reflection of the anisotropy in a polycrystalline sheet of material. And of course, when we are making cans, this earring is wasteful. Okay? You have to chop, or chop this part off. Now, one way of testing for crystallographic texture and the ability of that crystallographic texture to support the forming of metals. Forming means you make a shape without actually cutting and joining bits and pieces together. You make it in one go by using a die of the appropriate shape. So one way of testing for the ability of the material to sustain your required needs of formability is to do a test called a bulge test. Where you take a, a sheet of material, whether it's aluminum, steel, whatever, and you clamp it rigidly on its peripheries, and then uh, you bulge it. And the point at which failure occurs is a definition of formability. And that failure will be influenced by the crystallographic texture of the material. So this is a kind of an empirical but very important test for quality control, for example. Uh, a better method, which is obviously more difficult, uh, is to do biaxial tension. So this is a, a testing machine where you can pull a material along two directions while it's flat. Okay? So any anisotropy will be better reflected in a test like this than in the bulge test. And the specimen itself, obviously, will, will need to have two sets of uh, gripping regions. And it looks like this. So in this case, this is a sheet material, this is the rolling direction and the transverse direction. This is where the sample would be clamped. Now, you might ask, why, uh, why do we have these slots over here? Well, these are, are rigidly uh, held 
uh, and we do not want the deformation in this region to be affected by constraint provided by this region. So the slots reduce the level of constraint of the surrounding material. So we are really and truly testing the central region. So you can see why this test is very useful in research, but the bulge test is the one that's normally used uh, by industry uh, and initial stages of uh, steel development to assess formability. And you know, the, this is uh, from a car, the, the uh, floor of a car, and you can see tremendous advantages in just taking a flat piece of metal and forming the whole thing just by pressing it. Okay? Imagine if you had to construct this by joining many different parts. So this is an amazing technology with a huge amount of science behind it. Now, I've emphasized to you that uh, these stereographic triangles are all crystallographically equivalent. There are 24 of them. You see 12 here because we're looking at the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so if I'm plotting a property in one of these stereographic triangles, then because they are crystallographically equivalent, we will see the same, same variation in all of the stereographic triangles. So this is our modulus and we will see the same behavior in every single stereographic triangle that the modulus will be weaker at 100 by the same quantity uh, and stronger at the 111 points. So sometimes when representing properties on projections, we just use a single stereographic triangle. And uh, these are, uh, this, this one is defined with respect to the crystal orientations. And we are plotting the rolling direction from each crystal on this particular frame of reference. So this is called an inverse pole figure. So we're not plotting crystallographic poles, but for example, the rolling direction. Uh, now, sometimes when there's a very large number of poles plotted, it becomes a little bit confusing to see how concentrated a certain region or another region might be. So we instead use concentration or pole density contours on the same thing. So these are exactly equivalent, except this is a bit easier to observe. Now, how do we actually go about measuring the orientations of thousands of crystals? Well, there are many methods and X-ray diffraction is the most popular, but you can also do this on a scanning electron microscope on a routine basis. So imagine that this is our sample and we have a detector here and a scanning electron microscope observes by rastering the beam across, across the specimen. Okay? And there will be particular orientations of the beam with respect to certain planes within your crystal where you will get Bragg uh, the Bragg condition satisfied. So uh, the beam simply carries on through the specimen and is absorbed uh, and you don't get much of a signal. So corresponding to that particular Bragg orientation, you will get a, a dark intensity in your intensity map and that will appear like this. So you can see that this is a stereographic triangle. Here is a pole, a one-on-one -on -one pole. And, uh, and so on. Sorry, this is a fourfold axis. This is a threefold axis. So from these images, you can work out the crystal orientation on the resolution of the scanning electron microscope. So here is an example, which I showed you in the very first lecture, where the colors here represent crystal orientations that are plotted here with respect to the sample axes. And it's very easy to convert back from sample axis to crystal axis if you wish. So each color here represents the crystal orientation. And of course, we are getting the crystal orientation of individual grains and annealing twins. So the information here is pretty comprehensive. Now, Plotting poles on stereograms is, is very useful, but we are losing a certain amount of information that we don't know that these particular poles come from neighboring crystals. 
Okay, so we've lost that information. So I'm going to show you now uh, another method of characterizing orientation and it's using Euler angles. Now imagine that an aircraft that is flying needs to specify its exact orientation with respect to some frame of reference. I'm going to show you a movie of the three angles that would define that perfectly. So the first uh, angle is a pitch which involves an aircraft doing that sort of a motion. The second angle is called yaw, which is aircraft moving in this way, rotating about its vertical axis. And finally, you have the roll, which, which is a motion like this. So these three angles define its orientation in space with respect to some frame of reference. And just to summarize, we have the three angles, the pitch, the yaw, and the roll. Now these are called Euler angles and we can use them to specify the orientation of a crystal inside a polycrystalline material uh, and the external frame of reference of the sample. So here is our sample with the usual rolling direction, normal direction and transverse direction and there's a crystal within uh, and we are plotting now the rolling direction, normal direction and transverse direction with respect to the crystallographic axes of the red crystal. And the operations we are going to do will bring the two sets of axes, axes into coincidence. So first what we do is we draw the trace uh, of the plane that is normal to the pole and D, this, okay. We then rotate about this axis so that this rolling direction falls onto the perimeter of the projection. There we go. So the rolling direction moves onto the perimeter of the projection and the transverse direction moves this way. And this gives us the first angle phi one here, first Euler angle phi one, which is equivalent to the yaw motion of the aircraft. Okay. So that's the definition of the first Euler angle. The two sets of axes are clearly not yet into coincidence. So the next thing we do is we rotate about the RD dashed pole such that the transverse direction moves onto the perimeter as well and the normal direction will then come into coincidence with O01. And that gives us the second Euler angle, phi, capital phi here. Now the third Euler angle should be obvious that we rotate such that RD comes to this position and TD comes to this position and the problem will be solved. So, so here is the third rotation uh, which brings RD into coincidence with 100 and TD double dashed into coincidence with 010. Okay, so just to summarize, these were the original dispositions of the two sets of axes. So the first thing we do is we draw a trace normal to ND and we do a rotation about ND such that RD comes onto the perimeter. We then do a rotation about RD so that TD goes onto the perimeter as well. And final Euler angle is obtained by a rigid body rotation so that RD comes into coincidence with 100 and simultaneously TD comes into coincidence with 010. The two sets of axes are now coincident and the three Euler angles define the orientation. Now, the incredible use of this information is that 
if we have a three-dimensional plot of the three Euler angles, then a single point within that plot completely represents the orientation of that crystal relative to some axes. So here we are. This is a three-dimensional plot of the three Euler angles, and each dot here represents a particular crystal. Okay, uh, so each dot has coordinates phi one, phi two, and phi, and therefore it represents a single crystal. And you can you can see the relationship between two crystals because this will have different Euler angles. So you can calculate the relative orientations of those two crystals quite easily. So these are called orientation distribution functions. And generally speaking, we measure thousands and thousands of orientations. So this becomes uh, a cloud which is impossible to use. So we take sections of this cube along different axes, and that gives us uh, the concentration of poles along particular Euler angles. And therefore, we can work out the crystallographic texture. And as I said to you, you know, the number of poles can be very large. So it's better to plot contours of pole densities on the different sections of that orientation distribution function. Now, a pole figure, a stereographic pole figure is a subset of ODF. So you can derive the pole figures easily. And you can obtain this data again using the scanning electron microscope or X-ray diffraction or any other diffraction technique which is suitably equipped. So that's the end of the lecture on deformation and texture. And I started off by talking about single crystal deformation in which uh, some of the seminal work was done by uh, Schmidt and Boas who wrote a classic book uh, which I was given permission to make freely accessible from this website. Okay, so you can, you can learn a lot about crystal plasticity from this book just out of interest. Uh, not everything in there is relevant to your course, but I think it is well worth looking at. So this is the English translation of the original uh, book by Schmidt and Boas and you can download it freely from this website. Thank you very much.